Gary Rizzo and Jonathan Grieber worked as part of the sound mixing and sound editing teams, respectively, for the documentary Laurel Canyon that explores the music scene of the titular area in the late 1960s, and both earned Emmy nominations for their work on the doc. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and both of them, and both of them join me today. Uh, so, uh, Gary, I'll go to you first. Uh, the interesting thing about this documentary is that every, almost everything about it is archival, from the performances to the interviews to the footage. How did your responsibility uh, in, in overseeing the mixing of this play out when dealing with the sound for this? Well, um, it certainly had its challenges built into it. A lot of these songs uh, uh, come in in their natural, originally mixed state where they didn't necessarily mix a lot of this music in traditional left-right stereo as we are familiar with listening to music today, a lot of times they would do things like they would put the vocals in, and the drums in one channel and the bass and the guitars in another. And when you're creating a documentary film, you can't necessarily play things that way. You kind of have to break it down to um, the fundamental of it and look at the destination. You're trying to make it into what is acceptable to a contemporary audience. So we had to do some, a um, little bit of audio, archaeology to kind of dig it out, create a, a center presence to a lot of these uh, traditional songs. We, but at the same time, we didn't want to change these songs. Uh, we wanted to present it in a way that was um, emotionally fulfilling for the documentary, uh, but without changing the structure of it. And of course, you got to weave in a lot of this archival uh, interview material around it. So um, we certainly did a lot of preliminary work, a lot of pre-mixing. Um, John certainly did a lot of editorial preparations for the mix. Um, and we just kind of had to um, really take into consideration a lot of the handoffs from one piece of archival into another and the fidelity of those and how one would, in its most natural way and its most fluid way, hand off from one to another. Did that answer your question? Yes, and uh, and what about and what about you, Jonathan? Well, yeah, it's interesting because you know before Gary comes on to make sense of everything on the mix stage, I'm dealing with the picture department and you know my and my edit team, and they just have tons of material, tons of archival material, just keeping track of, oh, this is Ned, this isn't the performance we're going to use. We're going to use something else from them there, or we're going to use this, but this is just an MP3. We're waiting on master audio or we don't really know if this works, this transition that, and this music that we made, but we're gonna get a new one anyway, so you, you can fix it then. It's an overwhelming amount of media just to keep track of and know what is actually, you know, going to make its way in the final mix, let alone editing it and making it. Uh, so there's a lot of tons of archival interviews and you have a lot of older people being interviewed. So there was a lot of, you know, general cleanup with that. There were some challenges with matching people when they were younger to when they're older. Like for instance, we had Linda Ronstadt at a very young age and an older age. And there was a lot of concerns whether you could recognize that it was her. So we, we have to play around with those things, but all the while making sure never to alter anything in, you know, to make it not the exact way, you know, we're not gonna pitch her voice up to make her sound younger, but we're gonna try with pacing and maybe sub her to make it work. So there was a ton of work that we had to do that was a bit overwhelming. Uh, so by the time we did get to the mix stage and Gary really took over, it was great to have him there and to work with him on it. The other thing that's nice that goes along with, uh with that archival material is that um, Allison, uh, the director of our film, she was really interested in making sure that a lot of these songs stay in that nostalgic form for the listener and for the audience. And so we weren't afraid to play with sonic texture, whether some of these um, really high overhead shots of somebody driving their car convertible with the music playing, playing perspectives with that, little bits of echo and reverb that would transition to a full fidelity version of it. Like we had the ability to do that uh, in the hopes and in the efforts of really bringing the audience in and allowing them to connect the way that they remember the song, the way that they experienced those songs when they first heard it. And um, it's kind of nice to play around with the history of the music like that while fully respecting, you know, that history and, and trying to make it the very best that it can be. 
so if if, uh, if if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that you were trying to give it that feel of when people were first hearing it on vinyl, which, and, and I'm not even going to get into the whole debate about which sounds better, vinyl or digital, but um, because believe me, I know people that could go on for hours about that. But it, it, but you tried to give it that feel, you know, like they were, was, is that what you're kind of talking about? No, um, not directly. We're not trying to emulate vinyl in the, in the age of streaming. We weren't trying to um, emulate the fidelity that vinyl would give you, whether it was back then or now, but we're trying to really more emotionally connect to where people were and what they, how they recall hearing that or how they recall um, experiencing the first time that they were hearing that song. And, and you know, the nostalgic um, emotions that, that come up when you hear a song that you're familiar with that maybe you haven't heard for 30 years. Um, just trying to weave that into the narrative and into the story that Allison was presenting. And I think also um, something Gary might not be mentioning that he specifically does. When we take these stereo songs from the 70s, the 60s, and we all know how they sound, a lot of them just don't sound as big as we would want to hear them. So there's a lot of manipulation that Gary does to bring out the song and widen it and up the presence. So now we're, we're kind of hearing it, not in surround, but we're, we're more inside of the song. And for those emotional moments in the documentary, like Our House or Desperado at the end, whatever it is, it pulls you into a really big music moment. It's overwhelming in a positive way, hopefully, you know, but it, it changes the way, if we had just played it and Gary had just gone, you know, put it right in the middle there, it wouldn't have had the same effect. So I think that's something that we work on a lot too, a lot of time on that. Yeah, context, really. It's all about the context. How are you playing? How are you going to use this piece of sound, whether it's music, whether it's a piece of archival dialogue, how are you going to use it to maximize its value, its emotional value within the context of the film that we're making? So uh, the other thing I'm curious about is, uh, are, there, are there any additional aspects of doing this with archival footage that make it more difficult than, uh, deal than dealing with the mixing and the editing process, doing it with footage that's been shot specifically for the film? I mean, I, I'll let Gary handle this one, but yes, tons. I mean, it just generally sounds like shit. I mean, that's <laughs> just, there's really no two ways about it. It's, you know, there's, but there's a variety of bad ways it sounds, and you can only do so much again to not really alter it. But Gary, I mean, why don't you yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's fidelity. The word really comes, uh, the word it comes down to is fidelity. And, you know, um, people's home you know, TV and home movie experiences are getting better and better because they're upgrading their equipment. How many people are spending time at home streaming now? A lot. So, you know, they're going to get better speakers. They're going to get bigger subwoofers. They're going to get better systems. And so there is an expectation that kind of goes along with that. And it's so easy to hate. And there's a whole community of haters out there where they'll analyze or, and overanalyze everything, Blu-rays and streaming and, and all these different services. And more than anything, like we're, we, it's not that we keep that in the forefront of our mind. We just really, and I mentioned the words earlier, you want to maximize the material that you're given. And sometimes you can only make it 10% better than it was before you start to really modify the character of it. We're always trying to be mindful of that. We always want to be respectful to the history of each and every piece, um, whether it's an interview or not. We don't necessarily want to um, modify it from its original form. We want to present it at the same time, put it within the context of the presentation that we're trying to um, bring into uh, people's lives. You know, this music was so important to so many people the last thing you want to do is make it a very different experience, but you also want to present it in a way, it's 2020, that it's satisfying. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that both of you got uh, Emmy nominations for this, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, like, what was it like to find out? Because this is the first Emmy nomination for both of you. Um, uh, sure. I'm just curious, what was it like when you... Uh, woke up that, when you, I guess you woke up that, or maybe a little bit later that day, you found out, hey, you got nominated for an Emmy. I don't know, John, how did you wake up that morning? Well, I remember exactly how we both found out. It's kind of funny. We were working together remotely <laughs> on doing fixes for another music documentary that we just finished right before lockdown started, which is amazing. So we were doing a day of fixes and we were both like, check your email, dude. And we we're literally, I'm looking at him through a Google hang on the mix page and we're reading this and we're like, wow, is this real? Wait, did you got, wait, I got? Yeah. It was exciting. 
Yeah, I was, uh, I actually, that day, I, I did my work at Skywalker Ranch and John was working remotely from his home studio. And I, yeah, I got pummeled with text messages on my drive into work. I didn't know what was going on. I thought there was a family emergency. I had really, I had no idea until I pulled in, parked the car, checked. And that's when I started pinging John, hey, check this out. Something happened. Something happened. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, you never expect these things. You never anticipate them. You, it's, it's joy. That way it's a, it's a surprise and it's joy. And it, this really was a, a joyful, a joyful moment. And well, the interesting thing about, about, about the, and it's, it's interesting to hear you say that Gary, because uh, not only have, I mean, this is your first Emmy nomination, but you're also a two time Oscar winner. And uh, you know, which, it, you know, you won for Inception and for Dunkirk uh, in the sound mixing categories. And I'm, uh, what I, you said so you said it's so genuinely surprised about everything and it just seems it seems weird coming from somebody who's won two oscars no no but, no 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 the minute that you start expecting something like this is like the minute that it all blows up in your face so you can't ever ever go into this with any expectations and if this is the motivation for you doing the job like you're doing it for the wrong reason i love this job i love this crap I love the collaboration with people like John as well as people like Allison. I love working as a team to create something that's new, that's fresh, that uh, is uh, emotionally stimulating. Like there's so much reward in that, that the rest of it is like, yeah, whatever, whatever's going to happen, whatever the world is going to do, do with it, the world is going to do with it. Just let it out there and see what people think and just put it out there. So a genuine surprise. What I was also curious, though, was did you find any difference in your experiences between the two wins? Like, was there was there a difference in your in, in uh, your experience of winning your uh, second one from winning your first one? The Academy Award? Yes. Oh, <sighs> it, uh, they were they were both absolutely breathtaking. They were breathtaking moments. I I I hardly remember either one of them because they were just so uh, um, overwhelming. The second time, what was a true joy about the second time, not that the first one didn't have joy, but I had my, at the time, my nine-year-old daughter with me as my date. So I really could um, like deflect the moment and just watch her and watch the joy through her. Uh, so it was significantly different, but both, both unbelievable. Truly unbelievable moments. And There's not much else I can say. So the, um, uh, and this is also for both of you, uh, recently uh, we had a decision come down from the Academy. There had been rumors about um, possibly combining the sound categories and they've decided to do that, uh, uh, to combine both sound mixing and sound editing, um, which it, it felt kind of weird to do it uh, this, uh, this year after we actually had a split this year that a lot of people seem to appreciate uh, in, in those categories. And um, I'm, I'm curious for both you, Jonathan and Gary, how, uh, what, what's uh, your thoughts on uh, that decision? John, why don't you well, go? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it makes sense, honestly. I, I like it because it's still recognizing all the key people that it would recognize before. And it just makes sense to people, you know, like my mom, you know, just, wait, which one, you know, not that I've, been nominated i'm just saying it's confusing for most people you're not taking anything away from anyone you're just making it one category with the people that are deemed creatively you know necessary uh, for that job by whoever matters so i think it's a smart move if they were saying well now it can only be one mixer you can only be one supervisor yeah that would be a problem but they're not saying that so i, I think it's great yeah i i i agree i mean it's complicated because every film and every project is a little bit different and there are some uh there are some films where the separation is more obvious and there are some where it's so gray um there's a lot of mixing that's happening by the editors and there's a lot of editing that's happening by the mixers so and that's just the evolution of the technology and the resources that we're given uh, the fact is that we all have the same common goal which is we want to make something spectacular and we want it to go out into the world and affect people 
And so I'm, I'm totally okay with it. Um, I just more than anything like the collaboration. And so if the collaboration means we're all working together in one category, it's fine by me. That's exactly how I feel too. The highlight of this job for sure is the end on the mix stage where it's collaboration with people like Gary, the mixers, the picture editors, the directors, maybe producers. That's the magic of it where you stumble on something. Well, what if we do this? Or, and we did that on this show. We did that on Lower Canyon several times where we were just sort of stumped with certain things and then would be either Gary saying, well, let's try it this way. Or I suggested, well, let's have it coming from the car. Let's not have it come. Whatever it was, it's a, 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 a chance for everyone to sit there and just collaborate and do something you know, communal. And that's, that's awesome. That's, that's the magic. And so one other question I, I just have to ask is, so, you know, you, you're doing the, you're, you're working with sound, mixing and editing on all these, you know, on all these great songs that have been done, that have been made over the year, uh, specifically at this era, during this era. Uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is, did you, uh, was there any point where you had, where you had a song that you loved, but you heard it so much in dealing with the mixing and editing of it that you had to take a break from it for a while. <laughs> um, and no, I'll actually spin that. I'll go the other way. And I've said this to John a, a time or two. Um, part one opens with um, the Turtles. Um, and I put that song, John, pop quiz, what's the title of that song? The Turtles song. Happy, happy Together. Happy Together. and. I've actually had the opportunity to put that particular song into, I think this is the third film that I, I've been fortunate enough to, to mix it into. And I keep joking around because that's one of those complicated songs where it's like dual mono, vocals and drums here, guitars over here. And, and you find a way to spread it out and make it contemporary without undoing the whole song. And it, I, I keep joking around because I think I get it, a little bit better each time that I wind up putting it in. So for me, that's kind of been like an, a reoccurring song over the past eh, probably seven or eight years. It shows up once every two or three years that I get to put it in. So I actually, I, I'm a bit of a history buff and, and I'm nostalgic in my heart. And so no, I can't say that it ever drove me bananas. If anything, it just like, it made me smile. Yeah, I, I think that the there wasn't any song that was like, oh, God, do I have to listen to this again? But there was a lot of them, you know, and I think we're all big music fans, you know, and, you know, I was never really super into that genre of music, but I grew up knowing about it, but I had no idea, tons of things. I had no idea how awesome Jackson Brown was. Like, I really thought he was the guy that wrote that song that was in Fast Times with Richmond High, you know, Somebody's Baby, and that was it. <laughs> Hearing his old stuff was just, just floored me, and I, I find that all the time, just learning a little bit, or like, ooh, discovering this artist, and that's just the best part. So, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe there were some tracks in there that we've heard more than others, but it, it was so buried. It was it made it okay. Yeah, you, John makes a really good point in that being a bit of, of a history buff, doing these nostalgic music documentaries is, I find, to be so fulfilling, especially when you have a terrific, talented filmmaker behind it like Allison who's yeah. so good I don't know if you saw the Go-Go's yet I don't know if you've seen her other documentaries but she's so good and she gave us so much to work with that it was just an honest to God treat from top to bottom absolutely if you haven't seen the history of the Eagles part one that she did it's just it's I so think good. It, it's just an, it's just incredible um so yeah I, I echo everything here so. Well, Gary and Jonathan, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We wish you all the best uh, at the upcoming uh, virtual ceremony, I guess. Um, and, uh, thank you, to, Charlie. <laughs> and to all of our viewers, please like this video, subscribe to the channel to get our latest content, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com to make your predictions and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions uh, and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Charlie.